We're here at our Museums Collection Centre in Broughton. It's where we have the overflow collections of items from the Museum of Edinburgh, People's Story, Museum of Childhood and a little bit of the Writers' Museum. The collection itself, we don't have an exact figure um, just because of the nature of the collections. It's, it's so vast and difficult to put a definite figure on it. But we think there's roughly about 200,000 items in the collections. So it can't all be on display all at the same time which is why we have it in store here for whenever it's needed. The collections go back to probably around about 1870s. That's when the council first started actually collecting their historic collections. And the earliest stage of the sort of 1870s, 1880s, things weren't really written down. But around about the end of the 1800s, they actually started writing everything down. Um, and this is standard practice in museums. We use what's called the accession register, uh, which is this one here is the first of the seven registers for the Museum of Edinburgh and People's Stories collections. So it's the social history collections. And you can see it's quite a fine old tome and it lists everything that came into the collections. Now, I love working with these because the first few ones are just absolutely beautiful um, with kind of really lovely kind of cop copper plate handwriting. Um, not much information has to be said. Um, today we use a computerised database which just records absolutely everything we know about the object. Uh, what it is, who it came from, uh, if we bought it, if it was donated, uh, dimensions, if there's any damage, the condition of it, where it is. Really important to know where things are. Everything you can see in the exhibition around you has a record on its database and that location has been updated to tell curators, museum staff, where that object currently is. If you don't update it, you lose things. And it's as simple as that. So with this first register, some of the entries are very, very, very vague. So we've got one of our most important items is the copy of the National Covenant, the Scottish National Covenant down at the Museum of Edinburgh. And all it says is 131, which is its uh, number, National Covenant. And that's it. That is the only information we have about one of our most important items. So this is where the research bit is so important in museum work. So we don't have any information about how it came to us, which that's fine. If we don't have that information, we never will. This is probably going back to the 1930s. Um, some items are really interesting because there is this bit of mystery and a bit of detective work involved in it. So the first one here on the first page, I've got two swords and it says period of Charles I used at the Battle of Dunbar. Now, obviously, you all know your Scottish history um, and you'll know that Charles I was already dead by the time of the Battle of Dunbar. So that's wrong. Um, and we think we know which sword this relates to. It's currently on display at the Museum of Edinburgh and it has a lovely inscription on it that claims to be one of the swords used by Oliver Cromwell at the Battle of Dunbar. But the record here talks about two swords. And we've been digging around in the stores and we found this here another sword which is a rather lovely thing and inscribed on the the guard here is actually what is a very stylized and what we think is a stylized severed head of King Charles I. Uh, it's quite a common type of sword and what we think's happened here is that these two swords both came into the museum at the same time just were recorded wrongly so when they say period of Charles I used at the Battle of Dunbar, it's actually two separate swords. And it's that sort of detective work that we do a lot down at the collection centre, just to try and make more sense of, of what we've actually got. If you think about museum objects, if you compare them to people, this is your, your register of births, deaths and marriages, effectively. Um, the accession register, when an item is given a number, it's like it being, it's like a person being given a name and it's entered onto the register and it's, it's a, something that we can keep track of. Our conservator, Gwen, she's like the GP. She makes sure that everything is happy and healthy. I am marking some museum objects. So every single object we have in our collection is assigned a number and then that number is marked on it and the way that you mark it varies depending on what the type of object is. Basically, you don't want to fundamentally change the object so anything you do to it needs to be reversible. I'm going to start by just getting some acetone onto a swab and just cleaning the surface because there might be some, some dirt on the surface. And then I'm going to take 
what is basically a sort of glue in acetone so that keeps it liquid so you can paint it on and that is what makes it reversible because you can just remove it using um, some acetone so you're not writing anything directly on the object you're writing it on this barrier layer we're going to move on now to actually marking the numbers i've got the numbers written down here so ideally i won't make any mistakes but that does sometimes happen so we use this method of marking objects because other methods have been proven to be problematic or not very reliable. Now I'm going to put a top coat on and so the top coat is quite similar to the bottom except that it's a slightly different kind of glue and it's dissolved in white spirit so it's still reversible because you can use white spirit to remove it and it really is just as simple as dabbing this top coat on top. What do we do with an object once it's come into the collection? It's got its accession number and it's been entered into the register. Uh, we've marked it with the accession number. It now needs a good full detailed record on the database and a big part of that is photography. Having a, a good set of images, ideally of as many different views of the object as possible, is a really, really good thing to be able to refer to the object and track the progress of any deterioration and generally have an idea of the condition of the object. This is a little item that we have found while we've been working in the stores. It's a, a weight that would have been used in markets and shops. Uh, so when you're buying your pound of sugar, pound of butter, this is the weight they would have used on the scales. It's particularly sneaky because it says one pound on it, but it's not. And we've actually tried weighing it and it's just a little bit less than a pound. So it's a, it's a counterfeit weight. So when people were thinking they were buying their pound of sugar, they weren't they were buying less but still paying for a pound so it's just one of the kind of sneaky little things that we have in our uh, collections that um, we would have only known through weighing it and actually just uh, doing a little bit of digging around in detective work. These are objects that are in our collection of Buchan's Pottery and when the pottery closed at Portobello in 1972 shortly afterwards we were given quite a lot of objects that came from the pottery and um, we've been looking at these more closely and had some of the decorators who decorated some of the items come in uh, to do a story catching event and so that we found out a little bit more about these objects. These would be things that the decorators used in the pottery and uh, they were telling us about getting really quite excited when they were allowed to have uh, new brushes uh, because that would make their, them be able to more effectively do the decoration. So a new brush was something that was really quite exciting to have. And they also talked about the little glaze pots and being given those in the morning uh, by one of the supervisors or senior decorators who would give out the, the colours that they were to use. Uh, and they would be given out in little pots like this. But very often the pots of colour, they, they bear no resemblance to what the finished colour is going to look like so you've got to be really careful to make sure you've got the colours correct otherwise you'd go to all the expense and time of painting it and then it being fired and then find that it actually was not saleable because it wasn't in quite the right colours so it's something they've got to be really careful about. I'm going to be packing these objects ready for being transported to the City Arts Centre for the Old Reiki Retold exhibition so you can start by making sure that the box is big enough for the objects that are being transported it's a sturdy plastic box so they're really good for transportation and also for keeping objects in store. You can see what's in there, they're waterproof, and they've got lockable lids, really great box to use. And I'm going to line it with some inert foam that museums use called Plasterzote, but I just need to cut it to size. So now that I've got the Plasterzote cut to size and I've got the object placed where I want them to go, I'm going to take my poking device and put holes in different places. The reason for this is that they're all going to be tied in place. And then what I'm going to take is some cotton tape. I've got different thicknesses depending on what I'm packing. Then I'm going to cut some pieces to size and then thread them through the holes.
We have this collection in store because the past is directly linked to what's going on today. We can only really understand what's happening in today's society and where we might be heading by having some sort of hindsight, knowing what's already happened, and just an appreciation of how the city and its people have got to where they are today. The history of the city is still being made, so as a museum service, we have a duty to continue collecting to record the history and art of the city.